Hello, I'm Laura Marshall. And I'm Melinda Rose, and this is Light Matters for October 2nd, 2013. On today's show, lasers help shrink a particle accelerator. I bring you the latest LED news from the RadTech UVEB conference, and we explore a new miniature camera system that achieves the optical performance of a full-size wide-angle lens. In an advance that could dramatically shrink particle accelerators for science and medicine, researchers at Stanford used a commercial laser to accelerate electrons at a rate 10 times higher than conventional technology by using a nanostructured glass chip smaller than a grain of rice. Today's accelerators use microwaves to boost the energy of electrons. Scientists are looking for more economical alternatives, and this new technique, which uses ultra-fast lasers to drive the accelerator, is a leading candidate. A team that included scientists from the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in Stanford used a device powered by a commercially available titanium sapphire laser to accelerate electrons at a rate 10 times higher than conventional technology. The infrared light has a wavelength exactly twice the height of the tiny channel it traveled through in the nanostructured chip. These light waves have electric fields that oscillate back and forth as shown by the arrows. Green indicates a positive electric force that accelerates an electron. Red represents a retarding force. To achieve net acceleration, the electrons must encounter more green arrows than red. That was achieved by modifying the channel with a nanoscale pattern of ridges and gaps on the top and bottom. This increased the laser light's electric field between the ridges and reduced it within the gaps. Electrons traveling through the channel get a big energy boost that only slightly diminishes as they pass through the smaller gap fields. The net result is a significant energy gain for the electrons that are perfectly timed with the laser waves. Their initial experiment used a structure with over 500 ridges and accelerated electrons at a rate 10 times greater than the microwave-powered slack linear accelerator, which is two miles long. Their ultimate goal for the structure is one billion electron volts per meter, and they have already accomplished a third of that goal. Turning the accelerator on a chip into a full-fledged tabletop accelerator will require a more compact way to get the electrons up to speed before they enter the device. The work appears in nature. Wait, so they can shrink accelerators that are miles long into something that fits on a fingertip? Well, it won't be that dramatic. At its full potential, the new accelerator could do in 100 feet what the SLAC accelerator does now. Uh, the work is promising, but it's still in its early stages, so stay tuned. I will. This week I attended day one of RadTech's UVEB East Conference in Syracuse, New York. It was a nice chance to visit my hometown and catch up on the latest in UV technologies, especially UV LEDs. I attended several lectures and toured the expo floor. Some of the highlights included a talk by Robert Karlicek of RPI, who gave an overview of the evolution of UV LEDs and discussed the rapidly changing LED supply chain. He said that as the LED lighting market is getting more saturated, companies are moving into the UVA space for curing applications. UVC companies are increasing too for germicidal applications. The days of mercury lamps are numbered, he predicted. Another bright spot, pun intended, was a lecture by Jim Raymond of EIT Instrument Markets who is calling for the UV LED industry to establish standards of communication for measurement. UV irradiance values can vary depending on where you measure in or outside an LED, so if one manufacturer lists a measurement taken at the diode and another lists a measurement taken at the front of the lens, for example, how can those numbers actually compare? It's something the industry really needs to address, he said. Joshua Lensbauer of Armstrong World Industries gave a great talk on bio-based materials for UV coatings. The hurdles biomaterials face include the starting materials, the technology, the distribution infrastructure, and political or emotional support from the public. Acrylic acid and methacrylic acid are currently produced from petroleum, he said, so bio-based versions made from sugar, for example, will have to be cost competitive. Overall, the lectures were informative and interesting, and I look forward to next year's conference. A new type of miniature camera system developed at the University of California, San Diego achieves the optical performance of a full-size wide-angle lens in a device less than one-tenth of the volume of a regular lens. It can image anything between half a meter and 500 meters away, a 1,000 times range of focus, and boasts the equivalent of 2010 human vision. Such a system could enable high-resolution imaging in unmanned aerial micro-vehicles or smartphone photos more comparable to those from a full-size single-lens reflex camera. But the major commercial application may be compact wide-angle imagers with so much resolution that they'll provide wide-field pan and zoom imaging with no moving parts. 
The new system was engineered using monocentric lenses made of concentric glass shells that are perfectly round like glass marbles. Their symmetry allows them to produce wide-angle images with high resolution and hardly any of the geometrical distortions common to fisheye lenses. But first, they had to overcome two problems, conveying the rich information collected to the electronic sensors and focusing. The team addressed the sensor problem by using a dense array of glass optical fiber bundles polished to a concave curve on one side so they perfectly align with the lens's surface. They solved the focusing problem by showing that the changes in axial distance between fibers and lens did not distort the image. Next year, they plan to build an 85 megapixel imager with a 120 degree field of view, more than a dozen sensors, and an F2 lens, all in a volume roughly the size of a walnut. <laughs> Team members will describe their current device at the Optical Society's annual meeting, Frontiers in Optics 2013, which is taking place October 6th through the 10th in Orlando. Well, that's it for this edition of Light Matters, the photonics industry's only weekly newscast. As always, you can write to us with your questions or comments at lightmatters at photonics.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.